Hi, this is Kirsten Tynan with the Fully Informed Jury Association, and I have been out traveling and such, so I haven't had as much time to get material up on the website as I had hoped. But uh, I did want to introduce everyone to our summer fellows who we have joining us through the Charles Koch Institute um, Fellow Program. Um, we have with us Stephen Tanetti and Nathan <laughs> Shepik. <laughs> No. Did I pronounce everyone's name correctly? Yes. <laughs> okay, yeah. excellent. So we have been meeting pretty regularly uh, just to go over all of the great work they're doing, and it occurred to me that it might be uh, fun and educational for our uh, constituents and audience to kind of sit in. We do a group meeting every Friday just to talk about what everyone's been working on all week. Um, so we're just going to do that with a little bit of introduction since you guys don't really know what they're working on. <laughs> so uh, we'll start with Nathan. Nathan, if you could explain just in two or three sentences what the project is you're working on, that would be great. Sure. So um, my title is Jury History Researcher, so it's pretty straightforward from that. I research um, jury history in regards to uh, jury nullification and um, big cases with uh, either the defendant being nullified or cases regarding you know the defendant being charged with um, crimes surrounding their nullification advocacy um, and kind of things in that nature. So basically, each week I write up two case reports on a significant um, jury history case. All right, and Stephen, what are you working on? What's your project? Uh, so my official title is uh, Supreme Court Jury Ruling Researcher, and uh, I've been first working on a database of all Supreme Court cases, or not all, but as much as we can fit, uh, time permitting, uh, any Supreme Court case that dealt with jury rights, uh, whether that be jury secrecy or elements determined by a jury or voir dire, and doing a basic database with that and what the ruling was, what the holding was, who voted for, who voted for against. And after that's been done, I've been looking at important Supreme Court cases that relate to juries and have been writing more detailed case briefs about them. So putting in more information about specifically what the justices ruled uh, when they made their ruling in whichever case that I am working on at the time. Okay. Uh, so that is the introductory part that we don't usually do every week, but now that uh, you guys know what everyone's working on, we'll just kind of get to our normal meeting. And uh, how this usually works is we go around and talk about what everyone's been working on. I'll actually take a little turn because I turned up something interesting this morning. Um, but uh, we'll start with Nathan. Nathan, what, what has been exciting and new this week? So uh, I did two pretty interesting cases this week. Um, the first one is Ed Fortune, uh, probably better known to uh, people in the legalization community as N.J. Weedman. Uh, so basically, Ed Fortune, since his youth, has been a legalization advocate, and obviously this has brought him into conflict with the law a few times. Um, is anyone else getting really bad feedback? I am not. Should I, should I, I be not, turning? I'm not either. Maybe if you turn down your volume a little okay. bit. Okay. Yeah, that might be. I'm just going to mute myself. Okay. And... So let me start that again. Okay, fair enough. Um, so just make a wild, like, gesture if something's going wrong. All okay. Right. Um, so the case, uh, one of the cases I've been working on this week is that of Ed Fortune. And to those in the legalization community, he's probably better known as N.J. Weedman. And he's been an advocate uh, for marijuana legalization since his youth. Uh, he was, um, obviously, this has brought him into conflict with the law. And in 1997, he was arrested and served six years in prison. After um, this stint in prison, he decided to go to California, open up a um, dispensary and get a legal uh, medical marijuana patient card and really just you know, support himself and go to a place in the United States that supported his values there, as he said. And he came back, um, he did a really successful um, job from 2007 to 2010, and he came back in April of 2010 to visit his family. Uh, now, while he was visiting his family, he was arrested during a um, routine traffic stop in which 
they found over one pound of marijuana and a marijuana pipe. Uh, and immediately he was charged with not only possession, but under New Jersey law, because of how much marijuana was found in his car, he was also charged with intent to distribute. Uh, because how the law works is essentially if you have um, a enormous, then this is how the policeman explained it. If you have an enormous amount of pot, then we don't need to tell uh, prove intent. The intent is in how much pot you have. Uh, so kind of using that logic, he was charged with both these. And his first trial uh, led to a hung jury. And we pretty much can tell that that was jury nullification because from the letter of the law, he was guilty for both uh, under both charges. But they, a few of the jurors hung the tri uh, jury. And then in his second trial in October 2012, he represented himself again and basically explained um, and argued jury nullification. His refrain throughout the trial was, the law is wrong, not I, and basically, you know, just said, I'm a victim of this illegal drug war. These laws have no basis in uh, legality or ethical correct, uh, correctness, if that's the term. Basically, uh, just said that the jury should nullify these laws. And the jury agreed with him. They acquitted him on the much more serious charge of intent to distribute. Um, they did find him guilty on the possession charge. Uh, he only served, uh, I believe, three months in prison for that. And that was only, um, he was originally scheduled for 270 days in prison for that, but he was uh, brought down to three months after the judge left him, allowed him to leave prison earlier. Um, the second case I worked on this week is that of Luke Lamb. Uh, Luke Lamb was a Greene County, Illinois board member. He ran for sheriff in 2014 as the constitutional choice. So um, basically he wanted to advance personal liberty and he wanted to stop uh, over, um, overarching police authority. He had a few other things on his campaign slogan. And basically um, he just wanted to give a libertarian alternative to the current way the uh, sheriff was running his department. And in, two weeks before his primary, he had had three successful months of campaigning. He was running unopposed for the primary, and he was looking pretty much set to get the nomination. The current sheriff, who he would be facing off against in November, brought charges against him. Uh, basically, Sheriff McMillan called up the state prosecutor and said, Hey, I found this conversation on Facebook from months ago. I'd like you to bring charges. And from his report, he did, uh, the state prosecutor brought charges of unlawful communication with a juror. Um, and essentially what this conversation was, was Mark Boston, a Facebook friend of Luke Lamb, just posted, hey, I got selected for jury nullification. And Luke, um, I have the <laughs> comments here. He said, uh, hell yes, nullify, nullify, nullify. And then in the next comment said, here's a link to feed you. So it was very, there was no d really direction. The three comments, um, obviously were mostly in jest and in the end he was like just by the way here's Fiji's website um, but the way the sheriff and the state interpreted that was Lamb specifically telling him to nullify and influencing the juror and when Mark Boston's case ended up being ending in acquittal they attributed that to Luke Lamb um, kind of illegally influencing the case uh, obviously you know, it didn't really make sense to the defense how this was even possible because it was a Facebook comment made in a public forum while Mark Boston was at home. Um, and it was very kind of just educational. There was no, um, you know, him telling Mark, if you don't nullify, I'm going to unfriend you or something like where he was trying to influence him that way. Um, but the court rejected both of the appeals to dismiss the trial. Um, and that led Lamb to basically, you know, view the case as a political hit on him to get him out of the jury or out of the race for sheriff. Um, and during the trial, the defense brought Mark to the stand and Mark Boston said, yeah, he had no influence. I was going to quit anyway. They brought Lamb to the stand. Lamb said he had no idea that Mark had even been selected for a trial. And then they brought the sheriff to the stand who said, yeah, maybe my report was wrong. And at that point, the prosecution's case fell apart and the jury acquitted Lamb. Um, and even though the jury didn't really use nullification, um, how we tie it in is that it was a victory for jury nullification advocates, that Facebook indeed is a public space where you can advocate for it. 
and really the restrictions on advocating nullification are not as wide as the judges would like them to be, but they're actually much more circumscribed. Um, so those were my two fairly interesting cases um, this week. Nice. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and then, Stephen, what have you been working on this week? So I worked on two cases this week, two case briefs, one from 2014 and one from 2015. So I'll start for with the 2014 one first. That's a Warder v. Showers, and that primarily uh, dealt with jury secrecy to uh, sort of condense um, what the issue was at hand. Uh, what had happened was... Excuse me. There was a uh, individual named Gregory Warger who sustained injuries in an accident with Randy Showers, a car accident that is. And uh, Warger sued uh, Randy Showers for these injuries and uh, wanted money for them. And uh, the court ended up ruling in Showers' favor. But after the ruling, one of the jury members had called Warger's attorney and said that uh, a fellow jury member had expressed that during deliberations her daughter had been in a car accident and a similar lawsuit would have ruined her life. Uh, so there was the issue of whether or not she should have been stricken from the jury um, and sort of this issue of bias. So uh, Warger appealed the decision. And he said that she lied during jury selection process or jury the jury selection process, which means she couldn't have been impartial. And the district court denied his motion on the basis of the federal rule of evidence, which prohibited prohibits evidence about statements made during jury deliberations. And then the Eighth Circuit affirmed that. So it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court uh, affirmed that decision and said that the or jury testimony. Testimony about deliberations uh, cannot, test, excuse me, testimony made during deliberations cannot be used to prove someone lied during voir dire, essentially affirming the uh, secrecy of what the jury says during deliberations. And essentially that all boiled down to the fact that if the Supreme Court had ruled that this testimony could have been used to prove uh, that this individual had lied and should have been stricken. It would open the doors for attorneys to challenge uh, a lot of what a lot of verdicts that come back that aren't in their favor based on testimony. Uh, they could simply find any sort of statement made or if one juror wanted to express something and said, oh, well, this juror said this during deliberations, uh, they could use that then as basis to uh, bring a suit to a uh, retry the case. So in that sense, that was very good. Ultimately, it sort of boiled down to the fact that just because someone should have been stricken from a jury does not mean that testimony made during testimony about deliberations should be made admissible in court. So it really has nothing to do with the fact that whether or not they should have been stricken um, is sort of besides the point. Uh, you still can't bring comments made during deliberations to the court as evidence. Uh, and this sort of relied on the idea that you already have constitutional protections in place. Um, in one sense, it's sort of, it's tough that they didn't find this person during the voir dire, but uh, the a new trial can be had if they find evidence that's external to the jury that would prove bias. They just can't use deliberations. Uh, so really, there's still a way if a verdict is reached that the defendant or the plaintiff believes is unfair because of jury um, bias. You can still move to retry, have a retrial for that case. You just cannot use testimony made during deliberations. And I know, Kirsten, that you and I discussed the new case coming from Colorado, sort of dealing with jury secrecy or jury bias, um, with, but racial bias in that case. And uh, um, I think this case will be relevant there as we uh, sort of talked about the other day. 
Yeah, this was this was notable because if I if I recall correctly, wasn't this a nine zero ruling? Like yes, it was unanimous. This was, this was unanimous. So it'll be it'll be interesting to see that the differences between this and that case seem to be a that this was civil and that's criminal. Um, yeah. So the stakes are a bit different. Um, and B, what was the other one? Oh, the the topic of the bias. It's you know it's they just uh, dealt with um, a case. Uh, of of racial bias earlier this term or was it last term I, I can't recall but uh, so that's kind of a <laughs> kind of a key topic right now so I don't know if that will affect it but it'll be interesting to see how that turns out yeah it'll be uh it, that'll be one to watch I think as it relates to a uh, voir dire and jury secrecy uh, but anyhow the next case I did was from 2015 and that was Kingsley v Hendrickson and this was sort of uh, not really, they didn't really rule anything about juries per se. They sort of made comments on juries um, vaguely, uh, but they gave sort of direction on how jury instructions should be given. So this dealt with an individual who was a pretrial detainee in a jail cell, and uh, he did not comply with his holding officers requests and some scuffle ensued and he was injured and he sued that they used excessive force. So at trial the court, the judge, said that uh, the jury just needs to find that uh, the officers recklessly disregarded um, this individual's safety. His name was Michael Kingsley and that they acted with reckless disregard of his rights. The jury found in the officer's favor, and Kingsley appealed the verdict, saying that the jury instructions didn't adhere to the reasonable person standard, essentially, that uh, the jury should have just had to prove objective unreasonableness on the part of the officer, not that the officers um, acted recklessly, because that introduced a subjective element. The Seventh Circuit disagreed with his logic and held that the law required that subjective element to determine if there was excessive force for a pretrial detainee and that an inquiry into excessive force must prove that the officers intended to violate the individual's rights not merely that they uh, just did so the key issue was whether or not the officers went into that thinking we're going to violate this person's rights or in the event of the scuffle, whether or not, or if they just happened to. Uh, so initially, as I said, the jury was more concerned with whether or not the officers intended to. So when it went to the Supreme Court, it ended up being a very narrow decision, five to four, and they accepted Kingsley's arguments that his 14th Amendment rights were being violated. And they ended up ruling that in a pretrial, if a pretrial detainee brings an excessive force complaint, all he has to show is that the force purposely and knowingly used against him was objectively unreasonable. Uh, he does not, the jury, or the defendant does not have to prove to a jury that uh, it was subjective. They just, or excuse me, the plaintiff does not have to prove to a jury that it was subjective. They just have to prove that. Um, in the end, uh, my rights were violated. So as it relates to juries, um, as I said, this doesn't really, uh, the justices didn't really comment specifically on, oh, jury rights require this, and so this has to be um, this way. It was more that um, the jury sort of had, the way I interpreted it was that the jury, um, subjectivity into when you introduce subjectivity into a, a ruling it makes it more complicated for the jurors uh, I think so the court didn't really say anything um, per se about juries they just said that in this case jury instruction is was erroneous that it does not have to relate to subjectivity it just needs to require that objective unreasonableness uh, and in this case, they could not determine whether or not the error actually was harmful to the plaintiff, so they just kicked it back to the court. Um, not the what they said in the ruling didn't really 
have far reaching implications, I don't think, but it does sort of give you a lens into how the Supreme Court views how jury instruction should be. And in the case of excessive force, um, they think it should be objective. So um, that was that one. All right. Uh, I should mention here, I am dog sitting. The office is in my living room, as are the dogs. So we'll be editing this up a bit. We've had a couple little outbursts. <laughs> So if you see some breaks in, in Stephen's uh, portion of this, or Nathan's, or mine, uh, there was some dog barking. And if you hear any <laughs> snoring, it was none of us. <laughs> We've had everything from naps to, to wild outbreaks. <laughs> All right. Well, I've got a dog in the window looking at a dog outside, so it could go off at any moment. <laughs> But um, I'll just mention something that I discovered this morning that I found exciting. Um, I've been going through my books to get rid of a bunch of them so that when I move soon, I don't have to haul books that I haven't read and pl I'm not planning to read again and things like that. And I came across this book that I had picked up at some thrift store or you know garage sale or something, I don't know. Uh, it's called The Ideological Origins of the American Revolution by Bernard Balin. And uh, I'm really interested in this period right now because I think, don't even, just don't. I think that uh, we've kind of, like the, the importance of jury rights to the American Revolution has been kind of downplayed in most of all our, our schooling and, you know, in writing and stuff. And, and the more I learn about the American Revolution, the more I think that jury, the denial of the right to trial by jury was much more important to that happening than, than we realize. And um, so one of the things that I found in this book, it, it only just occurred to me today, I've been carrying it around for years, haven't had a chance to read it, only just occurred to me that today to look up juries in the index. <laughs> and uh, this is very interesting because um, in pre-revolutionary America, in New York, apparently there was some executive who was trying to sort of uh, get control of this wild jury situation that wasn't doing what the crown wanted <laughs> despite juries of course being like fundamental English rights uh, hopefully that helped uh, so one of the things that this executive tried to do um, was so he didn't want permanently tenured judges because they wanted to be able to get rid of judges who weren't doing what the crown wanted <laughs> Uh, but beyond that, it says that, uh, so it says, quote, the jury system, it was said in New York particularly, but elsewhere as well, was being systematically undermined. In New York, the same executive who had fought the permanent tenure of judges insisted on the legality of allowing jury decisions on matters of fact as well as of law to be appealed to the governor and counsel, end quote. Um, this was defeated, fortunately, but can you imagine you know, how easy it would be to just completely void the jury system just by saying, oh, sure, you got a not guilty, but we, we can appeal that. And the governor will decide, you know, totally objective person. <laughs> and this was at a time when tax, uh, tax laws were, you know, highly disliked and were trying, you know, people were trying to undermine them. Um, libel was, uh, there was a libel law that uh, was used against John Peter Zinger in which the law basically said, it doesn't matter if you told the truth, that's no defense. <laughs> so I, I need to look up, there's a, a note there that I need to look up. It doesn't say who that executive was or exactly what year that was, but that may have been around the time of the John Peter Zinger trial. So I'm a little bit excited about that, uh, just to kind of get a bigger picture of what was going on in pre-revolutionary America. So that's that's my exciting thing of the week. Um, so that's basically what we do here on Fridays. Um, I'm gonna wrap this up and then maybe we'll stay on and do another little portion if my dogs are quiet enough. <laughs> um, just so we can uh, talk about some of the, the cases in, in weeks past that you haven't been uh, able to listen in on. And uh, But for now, uh, thank you so much, Nathan and Stephen. Uh, I'm really excited about all the work you've been doing this summer. My only regret is that I haven't been able to get it all posted as fast as I <laughs> hoped, <laughs> but we will definitely get this material up there. So thank you.